Good morning, colleagues. Welcome across the state of Minnesota, surrounding states, and across our nation. Welcome to the 2021 Minnesota TZD webinar series. Today, we'll be focusing on common trends, looking at methadone, opioids, and other entities, and we have some scintillating conversation and learning time ahead of us today. My name is Mark Kindy. I'm one of the TZD co-chairs and the manager of the injury and violence prevention section at the Minnesota Department of Health. Great thanks today to the array of folks who have planned, who've contributed, who've helped to put this webinar series together. We have session organizers, the various E or electronic leaders, uh, speakers, moderators, technology experts. Um, we've got folks working behind the scenes and we depend also on our partnership with my fine colleagues at the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. You, their organizational and technological expertise is not to be underestimated and I'm just so grateful. Without all of us doing our parts, um, we, we'd be in tough shape. Our sponsors include the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, the Department of Transportation, and the Minnesota Department of Health. And as I noted, we're uh, hosting our hosting foundation is the University of Minnesota's Center for Transportation Studies. And we have massive support from the Do Good events staff. And so thank you, Susan, and all of your colleagues as well. Our, sp our uh, additional sponsors are include Bolton and Mank and AAA of Minnesota, Iowa, the Auto Club Group, HDR, the Highway Credit Union, and the Minnesota Prevention Alliance. And we are grateful to each of you. Thank you. Typically at this juncture, we'd pause and celebrate our award winners. However, today our award winners who you'll be meeting at the end of our session today are actually, um, I was gonna say on the ground, but they're actually on the airwaves uh, doing a TZD a media outreach event. This is what they do, part of what you'll learn as we acknowledge them. And so uh, Tyler's going to be introducing them at the end of today's, uh, today's webinar presentation. Now our moderator for today is Tyler Millis. And thanks Tyler for um, what you're doing. And um, it was just fantastic earlier this week to be in the webinar where you presented on the phlebotomy and the whole process and all that goes into uh, doing this effectively. And so just great to meet you and thanks so much. And now I'm handing it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Tyler Millis, the Minnesota State Patrol. I'm also the statewide DRE uh, program coordinator for those of you who joined us late, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Common Trends, Methadone, Opioids, and Others. Before we begin our presentation today, I have a few housekeeping items. There's both a chat box and a Q&A on your menu. If you have a question for one of the speakers, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can also ask for technical help through the chat box. So again, use the Q&A for questions for the speakers and the chat box for technical questions. We will get to your question at the conclusion of the presentation. If there is a question that needs immediate attention, we will answer that as, as needed. The TZD webinar series is proud to offer continuing education credit. These listed credits are available for this webinar. To find the forms, please go to the Common Trends webpage. For our law enforcement viewers, both board credits are also available for this webinar. Please read this important announcement from the post board. Whether you're watching this webinar live or recorded, please watch the webinar in its entirety and follow the instructions on the TZD web, website. 
the link to this webpage will be put at, in the chat box. The University of Minnesota will submit your completed affidavit of attendance report to the post portal for you. Now on to our topic for today, common trends, methadone, opioids, and others. One of our speakers today is Alex Graham. Deputy Alex Graham recently joined the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office from the St. Paul Police Department. He has been a DRE since 2015 and a DRE instructor since 2016. Graham was the lead SFST A-Ride and DRE instructor for the St. Paul Police Department prior to joining the Sheriff's Office. Deputy Graham recognizes that DWI enforcement has a direct impact on public safety. He enjoys the outreach and lecture aspect and hopes they benefit law enforcement and the public to try to, to try and drive Minnesota towards zero deaths. Deputy Graham has two MAD awards, the first for drug driving enforcement in 2018 and the second for outstanding individual dedication to impair, impaired driving enforcement in 2016 from the Colorado chapter of MAD. He is also a four-time DWI All-Star. Next, I will be speaking as well. I graduated in 2015 from Minnesota State University, Mankato with a bachelor's degree in law enforcement and associate's degree in psychology. I attended the State Patrol Academy in 2016. After graduating the academy, I was stationed in Fairmont, Minnesota for just over a year. I then transferred to West Metro Dog Watch where my primary focus was DWI enforcement. Lastly, I transferred to the Elk River Station where I also spent about a year. Last year in 2020, I took over uh, the DRE program where I became promoted to a sergeant. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get, we will get going with our presentation. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? We can, but we can see your notes still, Tyler. Okay. Well, those aren't very exciting. We'll get those off the screen for you guys. Good morning. I'm Deputy Alex Graham again with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, it's nice to see so many familiar names and faces, including my commander and a couple of my former St. Paul coworkers, Minneapolis City Attorney. So thank you all for being here this morning. We're presenting on common trends, methadone, opiates, and others. Uh, some of the topics we're going to touch on today are some of the more prevalent things we're seeing on the streets, as well as some of the things that are coming and uh, some of the things we're experiencing, uh, including Delta 10 and Delta 8. So if you don't know what those are, stay tuned. We're going to touch on those here in a second. So we're going to first start with opiates, uh, you know, something we've become more increasingly uh, familiar with. Uh, talk about heroin obviously it's derived from the opium poppy originally from asia but we're seeing it in all parts of the world uh commonly referenced in the movie american gangster um fentanyl which is synthetic opiate 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine according to the drug enforcement administration so originally fentanyl is developed for pain management and treatment of cancer patients it can be used transdermally so applied by a patch so dres we are seeing uh people taking uh pcas they'll be attending to a party who has a fentanyl patch will actually take the fentanyl patch off, put it in their mouth and suck on it. Yes, I've seen it. Yes, it's really gross, but you know, addiction is an ugly disease, unfortunately. Uh, and then it's also in an IV given to patients. And then uh, on the street, we're seeing it mixed with heroin and other drugs, specifically marijuana or synthetics. Um, if you think about it this way, if I'm selling a product and you know, Tyler's selling a product, I want to try and make my product better to sell more of it. You put a little fentanyl on the product, you get a different high than Tyler's product, the user may come back and purchase more of the source from me. Again, being addicted to opium versus uh, cannabis, a little bit stronger addiction that we see typically. So one of those things that we look into, uh, and just to keep in mind, just because you're seeing maybe cannabis, you're not gonna see fentanyl. One of the other side effects that we've had to the street fentanyl is that people are now afraid to take fentanyl when they go to the hospital, they think that they're gonna overdose and stuff like that. So just keep in mind, there is safe forms of fentanyl that are made by the prescription drug companies versus the stuff we're seeing from the cartels. And then obviously we have prescription drugs, morphine, hydromorphone, which is uh, under the brand name Dilaudid, hydrocodone, Vicodin, and oxycodone, oxycontin. So 
we have those all sorts of those prescription drugs as well as the illegal and the legal and illegal fentanyl that we see. Um, remember for DREs and for people who are certified in A-Ride, this is the only drug category that'll constrict pupils. So if it's uh, extremely dark out and they have pinpoint pupils, that's something to immediately key off of. And you don't necessarily need to use that in a traffic setting if you go to a domestic or if you go to a different kind of a call and you see those things, it's something you can start keying in on school setting um, where necessarily the pupil doesn't match the lighting source or vice versa. There's no lighting change or the lighting changes and the pupil size doesn't change. It's just something to keep thinking about. So what we're seeing on the street currently um, are these fake uh, oxycotton pills, oxycotton pills, the M30s they're called. Um, you may see them reference that in slang and text messages, uh, but these pills initially were uh, morphine pills. They are morphine pills, but uh, people have been putting them into pill presses, dyeing the fentanyl blue, and then people are taking them, assuming that they're still the morphine pill and they're having overdose side effects. So. Um, something to be careful of, you are seeing him in a car. Uh, I made an arrest on Friday. Uh, the guy had about 20 of these pills in the car um, with him. So we are seeing him on the street. They are prevalent. Um, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, we're seeing a lot of them. Yeah. Um, these are statistics from the BCA 2019 to 2020. Um, they suspected about 485 overdoses, um, 165 of those being fatal. And Narcan was used 240 times. This is a little bit of a skewed representation of what we're seeing. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot more of this happening. This is just what's been reported to the BCA. Um, with that, understand that people can go and get Narcan uh, a lot of times for free, and it's not against the law. So you'll see a lot of times users will have Narcan right in their cars. Um, there's there's people, I, I talked to one individual who had a bunch of vials of Narcan and he had overdosed a few times and he said he wasn't scared of it because he knew his friends would give him Narcan. Um, so just know that is a thing. If you're seeing Narcan in cars, there's a high probability that there's other uh, drugs inside of there as well. And there are some citizens that feel a need to carry it. They're EMTs, first responders, stuff like that. So you may see a Narcan um, pack in somebody's car that's not an opiate user, but they may have a friend or family member relative that uses uh, you know, opiates, or they just want to make sure that if they come across someone overdosed and they have the ability to affect the, the life-saving technique. It's not illegal to give someone else Narcan. It's not illegal for someone else to use your Narcan. So just something to keep in mind that, you know, when, but when you're looking in a car and you start seeing Narcan, we need to start thinking in the process of why that's in there. So these lock boxes, um, if you've never seen one before, um, a lot of uh, people who use uh, injectable substances like these lock boxes for two reasons. Number one, it keeps your drugs safe from getting stolen, which I guess would be a benefit to having one. Uh, otherwise, um, these make really good tabletops. So I spoke in depth with several users. What they'll do is, um, these pictures are both from uh, a local company, Target. You can go into the store and pick these up. Um, but these lock boxes are solid. You can open them like a book and you have now a table on your legs in your car. If you're using it in a car or on a park bench, that you can uh, make, a, make a drug kit. So you can put your cap uh, to fill with water to put the drugs in. And then you can also put the spoon and, um, and you can um, uh, prepare your drugs. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Sorry guys, it was a late night for me. I ended up arresting a DUI this morning and it started about 2.30 and we got done at about seven. So I appreciate you hanging in with me today. Um, but also these kits are important because you can keep your uh, needles from getting smashed. You can keep all your drugs in one location, but also methadone users do use these kits. I've seen a bunch of them with methadone users because the, uh, they don't want the, uh, the bottle of methadone to break open and spill the methadone out. So just keep in mind when you're seeing these lock boxes, they can be for a totally legal reason, but it's also uh, used illicitly a lot of times when we're looking for those little clues to put the bigger case together. So not inherently illegal, but just something to add to the puzzle. So the next thing I'm gonna to touch on is methadone. Um, there's gonna be a lot of information on these next few slides. They will all be available to you after it. I'm gonna to touch on a few things, um, but feel free to read through it as I go through this. So methadone is a synthetic opioid that was introduced in 1947. Um, and in 1964, so several years later, that's when it became um, a, 
a usage for people addicted to heroin specifically. So what it does is it reduces the opioid craving um, by blocking cer certain receptors in the brain and alleviates the withdrawal symptoms. If you don't know when people are withdrawing from these uh, narcotics, it can be extremely painful and very aggressive. So a lot of times they have to be given something to get off of it. Um, the biggest thing here is understand that methadone is a Schedule II drug. So what it doesn't do, it does not treat pain as well. Um, they'll a lot of times use this and pain medications if someone's actually trying to get off of this. Um, but these clinics, um, they are known as the OTP. They also have counseling therapy and things like that to help people get off of them. So when you use methadone, um, the subject remains physically dependent on an opioid. So understand that methadone is an opioid, um, but they're freed from the uncontrolled compulsive and disruptive behavior that, uh, let's say, heroin can produce. So they remain addicted. I can't stress that enough. They remain addicted addicted, but now this is a legalized version of an opioid. Um, the proper amount of methadone allows patients to lead a nor normal life, per se, without making them feel higher drugged. Methadone is designed to last 24 hours at a time. So again, understand that when they're given this, it's in their system for a, a lengthy period of time. Um, and then it mitigates any craving uh, for other opioid drug. Again, so they say, but a lot of times we'll see users um, go get methadone and then turn around and use heroin as well because it gives them a better high. So the idea of it is to get them off of that, but that's not always how it's used. Um, another thing is methadone is used orally. There's no need for injection needles um, and there's a very mitigated risk of diseases as well with this oral. Another stress point, in no way, shape, or form is a methadone user having needles. There's no need for them. It's taking, taken orally. Um, a lot of times in Minnesota, you'll see these red bottles in that picture. Um, what they'll do is they add a cherry flavor to the, um, to the methadone. They call it methadose. Um, but it also can be found clear as well. So they just drink that. Another uh, three other ways, I guess, you can take it is... Um, by pill form, um, like I said, that oral fluid. And then the middle one, they also sell these wafers. They're designed so that they can't be broken down and um, put in a needle. Um, just like any other drug, uh, people gain a tolerance to it. Methadone tends to be a lot faster. Um, similar to alcoholic, uh, the tolerant to methadone users can actually perform well during psychophysical tests. So, if they've been using it for a while, there's certainly a chance that they will do well on those psychophysicals. Um, and then they'll be less pronounced as well. However, with that being said, you'll still, as DREs, we'll still see that clinical indicators. They'll have the constricted pupils still, the, the pulse uh, respirations will be decreased, um, et cetera, et cetera. Unlike alcoholics, however, methadone tolerance can diminish as quickly as three days. So if they stop using it for three days, they'll be back to square one. And then when it comes to the statute, there, they, it, there is a possibility that they can use it unsupervised, but it's very strict or it's supposed to be very strict. Um, and there's, as you can see, there's, there's certain criteria that they have to meet. Again, these slides will be available. Feel free to read through this. Here's some more restrictions for that unsupervised use of methadone. So again, it goes in 90 day increments. The first one, first 90 days, they get one dose a week that they can take at home. The second 90 days is two, third goes to three. And this is usually when we start seeing the issues with these people abusing it because they're given more to take at home. Uh, maybe they have that craving and they take a, a couple doses at a time instead of uh, spacing them out like they're supposed to. The goal of methadone, again, is to change the addiction from the, the opium or heroin or whatever the opiate base, I should say, is and switch it to a more safer, controlled um, environment. So part of that is, again, the counseling and stuff like that. And unfortunately, with addiction, as we know, you see relapses, you'll see people making those decisions that put them at risk to engage in the abuse behavior. So uh, again, in the previous slide, it shows 
that, you know, there's supposed to be counseling evaluation of the home life. So the way the law is written is really to try and give the uh, person being treated, the patient, every benefit um, and trying to get them to uh, get off of the, the, uh, the substance. Uh, unfortunately, though, when you give people more and more room, there are those tends to slip and fall. And so we'll also talk a little bit later about where this falls in the DUI law. But it's one of those things to reinforce with uh, people who, if you're a DRE and you're, you know, an instructor or even a, just a DRE, you're kind of supposed to be the, the leader in the impaired driving field in your, in your agency. So this is something to share with, you know, new police officers that on your agency on FTO, people who have been through A-Ride, people who haven't been through A-Ride. But these are things that we can continue to think about and we can try and at least reference that person. If they do get arrested for DUI, they can look at the jail for uh, substance abuse counseling, stuff like that. And just because they get in trouble, you know, they may still be able to stay in their program. So just make sure that, you know, it's not a, we're not con saying that these are bad things, that just that there's the nature of addiction, the nature of the beast, unfortunately, is that when people get more room, they tend to make those mistakes. So part of that is holding them accountable, which does help their recovery in the end as well. So going on to our focus with the driving behavior as well. Um, Again, going back to our statute, it's a crime for anybody to drive um, under the influence of a controlled one or two substance. Again, methadone is a schedule two substance, so they cannot drive while this is in their body. Um, however, when you're doing the enforcement, make sure you still have impairment there as well. So blood results, if you, if you have someone under the influence of methadone, you get blood, they come back, Here's the doses. So therapeutic can be from 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams a liter. Um, however, that's with tolerance up to that 0.5. A brand new user at a 0.4, it could be fatal for them. So it is a very small amount of this, but um, just, just know when you get your blood re results back, it's not gonna be some crazy high number. So real quick, we're just going to conclude with the opiate section. Just remembering that, um, you know, uh, the opiate section or the um, narcotic analgesic section, if we're looking at it, will not cause HGN, um, you know, so there will be no VGN. It will not cause lack of convergence. So some of those other tests to remember would be the modified Romberg balance test or the finger to nose test. Again, the benefit for that is if somebody has uh, leg pain, um, or back pain, and they say they can't stand, you can always have them sit on your bumper or sit in a safe area to do so. Do those tests seated. So that is a benefit to um, making sure we can still get those good tests. And even if you say, okay, well, you know, zeros on, you know, HGN, maybe, you know, two, three clues on walk and turn, one clue to two clues on one leg stand. We still have some alternative tests we can go on. Um, and that's a good thing to remind, you know, veteran officers, even myself, and some of the newer officers, just that, just because there's no HGN, but they, you know, are acting, um, you know, sleepy, uh, heavy eyelids, we start seeing some of those kind of more telltale signs of opiate use. We still have tricks in the bag, for lack of a better term to say, to use to, to get that impairment piece and documenting that. So, and another part of the impairment piece can be the driving conduct, can be um, a caller, especially if they get a name and phone number. I'm sure attorneys, uh, you know, love that when we get the caller, the independent witness who called in, we get the 911 tape of them saying, you know, oh my God, they just almost struck a, you know, a cone on I-94. Um, you know, contrary to popular belief, those don't just pop up out of nowhere. The MnDOT <laughs> crews do put them down ahead of time, right? So those are all good evidence to have um, and making sure we document all that in the report, stuff like that, or somebody's on the nod. So what we mean by that is they're talking to you, they just close their eyes, you continue to talk, and they'll even talk back with you, but they look like they're asleep, right? So those are all good responses that we wouldn't expect to see out of someone that we're talking to on the side of the road. And the differences between fatigue, which can look a little bit like uh, opiate impairment, and um, stuff like that. So um, yeah, so we talk about that stuff. Like I said, just we want to keep those things in the back of your mind. And I always talk to the DREs, like I said, as you're the leader in your agency in drug driving enforcement and drunk enforcement um, because of your extra training. So this is kind of the time where you can, you know, bring out some of the officers who are wanting to learn who um, don't know what they're looking at and explain to them kind of what they're seeing. And I think it's a good uh, opportunity to kind of expand some of the stops. And just because something's prescribed to you, 
it doesn't necessarily make it legal for them to uh, drive under the influence of. So again, know that impairment piece is key. And then also making sure we photograph because the law does say that you should reasonably know. So if uh, the packaging has the do not operate heavy equipment, um, warning may cause drowsiness. This is a great time to snap a couple photos. Um, if the jail, if your jail will take the medication in, obviously you don't want to deprive someone of their medicine, make them sick. Um, you know, uh, but this is a good time to snap those photos, do the interviews, ask the questions. Have you ever read your bottle? Have you ever read the packaging? Have you ever talked to anybody about how does it make you feel when you take this drug? Those interviews really can expand to your knowledge base. I've learned a lot from drug users over the years because, you know, they'll talk to you if you build a good rapport with them and that's kind of the, the interesting part of the dre interview is you really learn some stuff about the narcotic world that you didn't know about especially if they're struggling with addiction they're a lot more open to answering questions and talking to you and if you actually have a curiosity of why they got to where they're at you'd be amazed what what they'll tell you after you just talk to them like a normal human um and then another reminder when we're dealing with opioids just be very very careful um wear gloves don't grab stuff unless you're certain of what it is you know if we're dealing with fentanyl we can overdose just as quickly as the next person so just be careful um you know like i said one of the questions i like to ask people before i ask them out of the car is on a scale of one to ten with one being the most sober ten being the drunkest most high you've ever been where do you see yourself if they have atrocious driving conduct struck a tree something like that and they tell me they're a one we obviously have, uh, you know, grounds to believe they're not telling us the truth, which I know to every police officer in this room is mind blowing that someone would lie to us on a traffic stop or maybe, um, you know, not know why they were speeding when they passed everyone like they were standing still on 984. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, you know, the other part is if they give you two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that talks about uh, impairment. Um, and then we can use that as a reasonable suspicion that requests the field sobriety test, which by statute we need to have. So um, we're building that case. And just that little question I've, has really opened a lot of doors for me. And, um, you know, I've had people look at me and say, yeah, I'm a 10. And I said, all right, well, do you want to do the field test? They go, no, I'm, you know, I have one guy looking and go, no, I'm drunk. You just need to arrest me. I'm like, well, can we just try the eye test? So, I mean, to a jury, though, I always think of how does that look? What's it going to look like on my body cam when the person says, yeah, I'm a 10, you should arrest me, officer. Even if he shows up in court, you know, clean shaven in a suit. And I never said that all the, you know, the prosecutor, which, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, Amy's in the room here. She would probably love to just push the space bar and play the video of my body cam with the guy saying, I'm drunk, you should arrest me. I mean, what are we going to argue about in court, right? So just some of those things you can do before people get out of the car, um, build your case a little bit. Those will help you expand. Um, which leads us into marijuana, the, uh, you know, drug with no side effects, if you ask the right people. So <laughs> we're going to touch base here on a little bit on marijuana and some of the synthetics and then the Delta 8 and Delta 10 that we're seeing. Um, if you haven't ever seen those drugs, it's really a fascinating thing that's coming up. Um, and so there's some good news, bad news on the stuff, and we'll get into it here. So the first thing we're going to touch on quick is just some facts. Um, in 2018, so they did a, a study, um, the NCDAS did a study, uh, emergency room visits related to marijuana increased by 54%, hospitalizations um, regarding marijuana uh, increased by 101%. And then they started looking back at toxicology results where people committed suicide, unfortunately. Um, in in uh, 2006, it was about 7.6% of the people. And then in 2017, it was 23%. So we're seeing that a higher uh, result from this as well. In Colorado, a lot of misconception um, is that when, uh, when states legalize marijuana, they're, they're looking at the money that it's going to bring in taxes. Well, Colorado looking at them for every dollar that they bring in from marijuana tax, they're spending $5 elsewhere whether that be on treatment, on um, fixing roadways, injuries, et cetera. There's a lot of money going outward for legalizing marijuana as well. And then in 2016, it costed them $25 million related to, to the marijuana DUIs. Excuse me. Yeah. So I was a police officer in Colorado before I came to uh, Minnesota. I was there when it was recreationally legal, and then I was there when it transitioned into, or I'm sorry, medically legal, and then it transitioned to recreational. So some of the things we saw initially, um, they had to rewrite the tax law. So they thought that they put an initial cap on how much money that they could gain. Uh, and that uh, had to be rewritten because they were gaining more than 
uh, they had. It became a uh, layover. Colorado became a layover spot for people. So they would fly into Denver International Airport. Uh, they would make sure there was two to three hours between their flights. They would walk out the gates of Denver. They'd go to one of the many stores. And there are, uh, last time we checked, more uh, marijuana retail stores in the city of Denver, city county of Denver um, than uh, Starbucks. So uh, it's a billion dollar with a big B business in the state of Colorado. Um, you know, the town I worked in, Parachute, Colorado, you'll have to Google it, I'm sure, if you've never been there. It's a booming metropolis of 1,100 people. It has eight marijuana stores. It also houses a large industrial uh, marijuana brewing complex for uh, drinks, also a kitchen. So uh, this tiny town, Town that was a uh, oil town switched over to marijuana, but you can't go literally a block without running into a marijuana store. So, um, but changed the way we did DUIs in uh, 2015, my last full year there, I had 42 DUIs in a town of 1100, uh, 35 of them were for drugs and most of those were cannabis. So um, the laws were having to be rewritten, searches and stuff like that were, uh, you know, canines, they had to pay for more canines because all the canines were marijuana trained. So um, there were a lot of side effects that came with marijuana. Now, uh, you know, there were there were positive aspects in that school districts were getting some of the money and stuff like that. If you had a marijuana store in your in your uh, district, you could get some of the uh, tax money. But like I said, uh, as a police officer, someone who worked the streets was a DRE. Uh, the cons definitely outweighed the pros, especially when it came to the education component as well as the enforcement component. So we'll touch a little more on that here in a second. The reason why we bring Colorado up is because the reality of it that's where we're headed. Um, I would assume eventually here, it'll be in Minnesota. So we're, we're trying to focus on the states that have already legalized it to learn from them and get ahead of this. So just real quick in the 90s, um, another big misconception is the THC levels. It's, it, we'll talk about THC in a minute here. Um, it's a psychoactive ingredient in cannabis. But in the 90s, THC was about two to 4%. 2014, an average 14%, upwards of 37. I would say most most of the time we're right around that 20 to 25% right now, um, just the street weed. Uh, CBD, so as a reference, CBD is 0.3%. Edibles can go all over the board. It just depends on what they're making and what their out, desired outcome is for that. And then the big thing, especially in youth right now, is the wax, or also known as DAB. Um, can get upwards of 99.9% THC. So very, very important. Yeah. So, and retailly, retailly speaking in, in like Colorado, for example, like I said, it's where I came from. You're going to sell for about 32%, 28 to 32%. If you're selling any less than 28%, your product's not going to move. So, um, you know, it's very high potency. People say, well, Cheech and Chong smoked it all the time. Well, they were smoking two to 4%. So, we're not talking apples to oranges here. And so that's one of the things we have to change the culture on. And um, as DREs, A-Ride, and people with a stake in impaired driving enforcement, we have to look at it and say, we're not talking about two to 4%. We're talking 32%. It's the difference between, you know, uh, drinking a, you know, Jack and Coke versus, a, you know, a light beer. You're, you know, you're going to get more potency with, you know, the same 12 ounces of uh, Jack, you know, than you would with the same 12 ounces of a light beer. You're just it's a stronger brand. So we just have to keep thinking about it and um, being the educators in that field and really bringing people to the forefront. So, and then wax is like Tyler was saying, 99% THC. Um, you can look it up online, how to make it wax lab explosion, pardon the pun, but blew up in Colorado, went from, you know, everybody was worried in the early 2000s about, uh, you know, clandestine meth labs. Well, people were blowing up their houses left and right in the state of Colorado. Uh, trying to make waxes um, because, you know, there were users and addicts and they were not, you know, being scientific and it was a pinch of this with a pinch of that and house blows up, you know, in the middle of nowhere and people are on fire and it's not good. And another thing I like to touch on with the wax too is it, for the, the cops in the room here, um, when you have, find those little uh, rubber containers that are about yay big, um, that can get a lot of people high if that's filled with wax. They just take, they call it a dab for a reason. They take a dab, a pinpoint of it, and that gets them high. So when you find those little uh, cylinder, what are they even called? The cylinder. They're like uh, the size of a half dollar. Yeah. When you find those and they're full, that can get a lot of people high. So just understand that. And in the state of Minnesota, any amount of marijuana wax is a felony. Now, some counties like Ramsey won't charge it unless you have 42 and a half grams. That would do a lot of damage. That will 
take a whole herd of elephants and have them orbiting Pluto. So just keep that in mind of that, you know, that technically it is illegal, it is a felony, but you know, what your county does or what your municipality wants to charge obviously varies, but state law says marijuana, oil, wax, felony. So uh, going back to that THC, um, it's going to be that impairing chemical that causes a psychological effects in marijuana. Um, there's different versions, which we're really going to quickly touch on THC, A, THC, B. Uh, we're going to spend the most of the time here talking about Delta A, Delta 10. Um, when we talk about Delta 9, that's the typical THC that you hear about. So, And for those who aren't aware, the little triangles, the Delta symbol, if you've never seen it before, that'll be uh, on the, uh, on the uh, response from the lab, depending on the lab you use. So just keep that in mind. So... Neither of us are here to say that marijuana cannot benefit people uh, with illnesses. I, I do believe that they absolutely can. Um, so when we look at these benefits, this is what um, um, marijuana doc, I got it online. That's what they say that the benefits are. So just understand there is benefit for each of these as we go through them. Um, so THCA is not psychoactive um, or mind altering. And then it sources the other types that we'll talk about. Um, by adding sunlight and heat to it. So everything starts with THCA. So some of the benefits cures epilepsy. You can help epilepsy, nausea, arthritis, inflammation, fibromyalgia, chronic back pain, diabetes, MS, ALS, whatever else you can think of for it. So yeah, sure. So THCV is a byproduct of THCA. So it's a piece off of that THCA compound. It's purported to have no mind altering properties and low doses. So again, the caveat to that being low doses. We know that sometimes drug users don't use low doses of things. So keep that in mind. Uh, you may feel uh, the effects more rapidly or the user may feel the effects more rapidly. It's an appetite suppressant. So it can help you lose weight. Oddly enough, marijuana can help you lose weight. Benefits, uh, so diabetes, uh, pain and swelling, anxiety, tremors from Parkinson's and ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease brain lesions for late stage Parkinson's, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and other related conditions. It stimulates bone growth. So going on to the hot topic here, Delta-8. Uh, for those of you who have not seen it, you will see it. Um, there's a big struggle throughout the entire country right now. Um, by the way, laws are written that this is legalized. We're gonna show pictures in a little bit. You can buy this stuff right in St. Paul. Um, 1200 White Bear Avenue, if you're curious. <laughs> Don't go try it. No. You can go look. Um, that's another another uh, a tip, too, that I'll just get on quick. If you end up going to a state where marijuana is legalized, go into those dispensaries and ask questions. They, are, they love talking about their products. You can learn a lot. Yeah, and the dispensaries, it, real quick, um, they're not like a uh, grimy, dirty feel. It is no. nicer than any gas station you've ever been to. It's nicer than any pharmacy you've ever been to. Extremely clean, extremely well lit. Um, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the um, some of the law components of why that is, but uh, extremely clean. And the, the bud tenders, as they're called, uh, behind the counter will be more than happy to answer all your questions about the greatest drug ever made, marijuana. I'm actually going to skip forward. Let's talk about Delta 9 first, and then I'll go back to Delta 8. What's that big word, Tyler? Tetrahydrocannabinol, for those of you that are curious. That's what THC is, so. Tetrahydrocannabinol. So Delta 9 is, is going to be, when people say THC, this is what they're going to refer to most commonly. It's a main psychoactive compound. Um, surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, just a fun fact, uh, the concentrations could be a lot higher in female plants. So if you go to the growth facilities, they're going to have all female plants. Um, that's just how it works. I don't know why that is. I guess our males may be lazy or something. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, it will produce a high. Um, they say it, it reduces anxiety, improves sleep. I, I, it depends on the strain you're getting also. So understand there is variation to this as well. Um, reduces swelling and pain, promotes brain growth. So they say. Um, helps PT, PTSD, um, and, and understand again, there's a lot of benefits there can be. You know, one of the things that, uh, is hard is that marijuana, because it's a schedule one controlled substance, it makes it harder for us to study it as a federal government level. They've loosened up some of the restrictions in studying it, but, um, 
you know, and the reason why we're really going to hit on this marijuana and spend a lot of our time in it and people are like, oh no, weed again, because, uh, and I'm telling you from my own experience, being a small town cop, 1100 people, 42 DUIs, 35 drugs, people are so used to seeing don't drink and drive, Bud Light sponsoring, Miller Light sponsoring commercials, Super Bowl commercials. People go, I drive better high. I can do more high. They feel like it's a, it's not a, a taboo in culture. So you're going to see when this becomes more widely legal with the change of recreational, or I'm sorry, medicinal marijuana going from just the oils to the green leafy substance, we're going to see a diversion from the problems we've been having to a more increased, and we're going to see a more potent effect. So you know, the stuff that they bring up from Mexico, um, the cartels or, um, you know, the drug runners, that, that's lower THC levels. We're going to go from, you know, Diet Coke to Mountain Dew pretty quick uh, as far as, you know, the strain and the effectiveness. So um, just keep in mind, there are two types of uh, strains of marijuana, the primary two strains, uh, indica. So the way I remember indica, it's more of a depressant uh, into the couch. And the sativa, people use that in the morning, they'll say, because it wakes them up, it gets them more alert for the day. So depending on what people have, uh, the pharmacists at the, uh, uh, at the medicinal stores or when it does become recreationally legal, the bud tenders, as they're called, will give you a recommendation based on what you're looking for. You describe a series of ailments, and then they say, well, you should use grape ape or sour diesel or OG Kush, and they'll give you based on what you pulled them their recommendation for that specific strain. And so some of the plants are cross-pollinated and there are mixtures of indica and sativa, the hybrids, um, but it's just something to keep in mind as far as knowing the language, because when you start talking with someone, um, especially in Colorado, where it became more of like a wine culture, um, mm -hmm. people go to cannabis retreats on the weekend. Mike Tyson own, uh, owns a huge cannabis, like mega complex that people go to visit, right? So you have, um, this culture shift and if you walk up to the car and say hey what kind of weed do you smoke people take offense to that and they'll shut down right away they'll say i don't smoke weed that's a dirty word that's a drug i use cannabis i consume cannabis it becomes a a whole culture and so if you don't speak the lingo you don't get that door open for you and like i said uh you know if you've never used it or if you've never seen it whatever um the only way you're going to learn about it without probably getting in trouble is by uh, speaking to people about it. So knowing those important things. And then if you get them talking, right, we, that's what we do as police officers. We get people to talk and open up to us in an interview. Well, it'd be really good in a fatal crash to hear the person that they love to smoke all day, every day. And they, um, you know, use it in the morning first thing and they use it before they go to bed and they smoke 10 minutes before they drove. You know, if you don't think that there are fatal accidents in marijuana, I know Sergeant Moore's in the room. He worked a, a fatal on Rice Street in St. Paul where the person admitted to being high under the influence of marijuana and ran over a pedestrian. So we are seeing fatalities from this drug. It is a real consequence to using it. So we have to be the experts in this field and we don't get a second chance, unfortunately. So when we miss those little clues on initial contact, it can have some pretty serious repercussions. So. All right, backing up to Delta 8. So again, if you haven't seen this, you will, it's coming. Um, it, it happens after Delta-9 ages and it is exposed to oxidation. Not as potent as Delta-9, but still produces the high. Again, understand that people typically, mostly, are going to use this to get high, so they will use enough to get them to that high level. Um, the euphoric feeling tends to be less intense than Delta-9. That's if we're taking the same amount of Delta-9, Delta-8, and comparing them again. Um, benefits it can decrease nausea and vomiting. Um, helps protect brain cells, reduces anxiety. I, again, there is value to it. It's just if it's used in the right way. So keep in mind, though, the DUI law does cover this. I'm sure somebody's going, oh, crap, what do I do? You know, we yes. do have this section of the DUI law. It says use a substance that the user should know reasonably can impair their ability. So just remember that we don't necessarily have to be in that schedule category because that's how we do marijuana DUIs mm -hmm. anyways. There isn't a, a legal section that says you can't use marijuana or we have a per se limit. So we have stuff like that. Um, so we have that stuff to look at. So um, just remember, there are ways to still charge us as a crime and hold the people accountable. We're just giving you the knowledge. Um, do we have it on the slide about the testing? No. So no, we did so. talk to the BCA, which they can't test for Delta-8 at this point. Um, we also talked to uh, NMS, which is out of Pennsylvania, which is considered one of the best uh, labs in the yes. country. 
not in do, endorsing them specifically, but they are, um, the way that I've been explained it is most states can buy, you know, nice machines, the Chevrolet or the Ford version of the testing machines. NMS has the Ferrari of machines. So they can detect minute amounts of chemicals that might be uh, metabolizing out of the system. Again, some drugs, cocaine, et cetera, chew through your system very quickly. Uh, NMS is the ability to pick that stuff up. They can't even test for it right now, but they are working on getting the machines. So again, this is important where that good interview, if you have a conscious uh, driver that's committed a crim vehicular uh, operation or crim vehicular homicide, photographs of the stuff on the inside of the car, going back and getting video, you know, it's pretty bad evidence when the person who just killed somebody an hour later was in the store, you know, at uh, 1200 White Bear and they were buying uh, Delta 8. So, you know, it's good uh, evidence to have um, and good to maintain that stuff. So just something to keep in mind. It's not woe is me. There is ways to still prosecute this successfully. We don't want you to sit there and think, right, you're, you're dead in the water. There's nothing we can do. Let's just throw up our hands and go home. Again, same thing with uh, the opioids we talk about. If they have the packaging, take pictures of it, take it as evidence. That's huge. And the same thing goes with Delta 10 NMS or the BCA. Neither of them can test for this as well. So what happened here is uh, they started working on Delta 8. Now states are kind of catching on to Delta 8. So now they're trying to make Delta 10. And we'll just keep uh, chasing this ball down the, down the road here. Um, so Delta 10 is very, very new. Um, it's a lot harder to make. So they're still working on it. Again, I'm we're showing you this because it could come up. You could start seeing it um, if you haven't already. It's, again, less potent than Delta 9, commonly processed processed from a hemp derived CBD. So that's another difference. It's coming from hemp. Um, and then again, going back to the law that hemp isn't necessarily illegal in some ways, but, but like Alex said, you got to go back you know, when we're talking about DWI and, and how the law is written, you should, should have known that it could cause this. Um, commonly reported to pr provide energizing effects. Again, we talked about it, but similar to sativa, uh, the the strain that's gonna make you awake. Um, and it causes more of a head buzz as well. It has a clear appearance. There is a picture of it there on the screen. It almost looks like a, a rolled up spider web kind of. Um, and then when the way they create it is they take uh, crude CBD or CBD isolate, and they'll either add vitamin C and carbon to it, or they'll start adding chemicals as well. I apologize. Tyler's alarmed to wake up Sorry. today. Yeah. Just kidding. Anything to add on Delta 10? No. Um, like I said, it's not a woe with me thing. We do have ways to uh, uh, prosecute. Like I said, just make sure we're taking photographs. You know, again, this is probably going to be something we're going to see in the high schools. Um, people are going to say, well, it's from hemp. You can't arrest me. Well, it's not true, right? We know that if you, you know, are using whippets, right? There's nothing illegal about using a CO2 cartridge or, um, you know, using a uh, uh, you know, a mass amounts of Benadryl or NyQuil in high doses of Robitussin. It's not illegal to own Robitussin, right? Everybody here probably has seen the Robitussin in the stores that wouldn't be on the shelf, right? But using it in a high dose that impairs your ability to operate a vehicle safely, that we can articulate impairment makes it illegal. So it's, game's not over. You just got to know how to articulate it and talk about it. And this is, again, the DRE's opportunity to speak with officers um, and to work with them. And like I said, one of the better feelings that I have is when you teach someone um, how to do a marijuana DUI stop. Absolutely. And then you see their reports start coming through or they call you and say, hey, I got one. And, you know, they call you and their Delta 9 comes back at, you know, you know, 30 nanograms per milliliter. And they go, hey, is this good? And you're like, yeah, that's a home run any day of the week. So, um, you know, aggressively prosecuting these cases, making the streets safer. You're going to have to educate your uh, prosecutors as well. Um, you know, I've been lucky. I've had prosecutors that are willing to talk to me about um, the drug driving components. Um, but, you know, I look at it as part of my job to make sure that when I present the case that they understand what they're looking at because they've got a lot to deal with and if they have to deal with a domestic and, uh, you know, a gross miss possession of a pistol without a permit and a DUI, they can't be experts in all the fields. That's where our job to step up and present those things are. And, you know, um, the Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor, Bill Lemons, is a wonderful resource to have. You yep. can also reach out to them or they can reach out to him. So knowing where those resources fall really helps, I think. I've had conversations with prosecutors, and, and it's just, like you said, there's so much involved in it that a lot of times they're just not aware or, or don't know enough about it. So reach out to me, reach out to Alex. Um, Minneapolis has a huge, 
uh, a big shout out to them also, but they have several prosecutors that have gone through the DRE school. Um, I've talked to Amy and uh, she's in the audience and uh, David Bernstein both and had them talk to a prosecutor with me to just educate. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will have those conversations and help you out in, in any way we can. Amy loves off the wall DUI questions. I'm waiting oh, yes. for her to hate text me any second, but uh, <laughs> she, I, I always try and if I've, got a, if I've got a tough question, she's a wonderful resource to have over in Hennepin County. So um, her and David, David Bernstein works on the DUI task force. So I know there was a question about law enforcement working with uh, the legislature, the DUI task force presents um, all the stuff DUI related to the legislature. Um, they're a phenomenal resource that we have in this state and we're lucky to have them. So, so these next few slides, uh, we're going to show you some pictures from Minnesota and then get into some pictures of Colorado again, just showing you what we could see coming um, sooner than later. The Minnesota pictures, Alex took himself. So this is real stuff. If I can switch, there we go. So these are all taken from uh, a gas station on the east side of St. Paul. Um, I was there uh, pulling video for a different case. I looked over at the, uh, the case to my right, and uh, they're sitting right there. Actually, I think you can see my sheriff's vest in the back of the first picture. That's, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> for those who are concerned um, about their dietary needs, there are vegan gummies for uh, Delta 8 THC in birthday cake flavor. So uh, you can use it for any occasion. Uh, 35 pieces, 25 milligrams. It was like I don't know, 15 bucks. It was pretty cheap. Um, the deep eight fortified greenhouse flower. So all these things are just sitting there locked in a glass case because they had them out originally on the shelves and they were getting stolen left and right. So in the interest of business, Surprising. right? In the interest of business, they, uh, they put them behind the locked glass case. So again, these are all things that were readily available on the shelf. Uh, the, the guy behind the register was asked me, he's like, Oh, do you want to buy some? I said, no, I'm good. Thanks. Uh, but, uh, I mean, no, no big deal to go walk in and buy it. You can go buy it right now if you're so inclined. Um, so again, more uh, stuff. Uh, Kratom is another drug. Uh, it's uh, you know a whole separate uh, topic unto itself. But if you want to look it up, Kratom, K A or K R A T O M. You need more coffee. Um, again, they've got the Delta Eight Hemp Smokes, uh, the Chief Six, and then more Quick Fix Plus. I think that was the synthetic urine. So, um, you know, you got to beat the test somehow, right? So they did sell synthetic urine. There's um, butane lighters and stuff below that. So, like I said, this is all right out in the open, right in plain view. Um, you know, if you go into any of the uh, gas stations in your area, you know, they'll sell Kratom. They'll sell stuff like that. So, I mean, you can find this on Rice Street. You can find it on White Bear Avenue. You can find it anywhere in the city of St. Paul. Um, there's different spots with it not endorsing it, not condoning it. Um, it's technically legal over the counter right now, yes. but again, just because it's legal doesn't make it legal to take it and drive a vehicle. So we have to split those theories, right? Legal to own, not legal to use and drive a car with impairment. So just keep that in mind. Again, that quick fix, you see that in a car, why would I need synthetic gear in? Unless you're going deer hunting, I guess, maybe, I don't know, but that might not work that well for a deal, who knows? <laughs> so we're going to Colorado. Um, do you want to talk about your contact out there, just where we got these pictures from? Yeah, so there? Jen Knudsen's uh, the traffic safety resource prosecutor. She's a DRE classmate of mine in 2015. Uh, took these photos while she was teaching a class out in Rifle, Colorado. Again, another booming metropolis. I'm sure everybody's been there a hundred times. It's to the west of Glenwood Springs, so about two hours west of Denver. But this is all stuff sitting right out in the open. She walked into the dispensary when uh, they were doing their site visits. Um, and this is all stuff you see. These are, um, you know, they have at Kush cards on Instagram. So, um, you know, you can look at that. Those are things you can buy. You can give people high wishes for their birthday. Um, you know, the state of Colorado took down most of the mile marker 420 signs. They will say 419.99 instead of uh, 420 because they were getting all stolen. So um, racing to wish you a happy birthday from Kush cards. So just stuff that you see, it's, it's like I said, we're changing the culture. We're changing the aspect of how we look at marijuana. We're not looking at it as a back alley deal. This is right out in the open. Um, you're going in, you're buying stuff, just like you'd walk into Starbucks and order a tall coffee. Um, this is the same principle. It's not, you know, it's right on Instagram, right? So it's got to make it official at some point. So another thing, um, if you look at the left picture there, those dab extracts, again, this is right out in the open. Um, understand though, um, at the bottom, 
of that picture, the tag there in the bottom right, it'll show the percentage. So the purple, uh, what is it, purple skunk? Yeah, purple skunk wax. It's 83.4%. Um, and it's a, uh, looks like a sativa hybrid. Uh, purple diesel wax, 84.62%. So they'll, they will show the actual level of the THC in the product as well. Obviously, people that smoke wax, they're going to need a torch. So there's a torch right next to it. Um, and then keep cola as well. Yep. So again, marijuana is not restricted to just the green bud anymore. We have to think of it as it's in everything. They have uh, candies, coffees, foods, wine, beer, beer, uh, pretty much anything and everything you can somehow infuse marijuana into, they're going to do it. So just keep that in mind that, um, and then looking back at that wax, you see the, on the right, we'll look at the purple diesel wax, that large chunk kind of looks like a Tito's, uh, just Tito's pizza roll. That's not what you would smoke. It would be smaller, probably half of one of those side pieces would be the, the ideal dosing amount. So you smoke the big one, you're probably going to go catatonic or get marijuana psychosis, which is a fully separate uh, lecture unto itself. But uh, essentially your mind breaks with reality. Denver does have a confirmed uh, marijuana death. The guy uh, smoked a bunch of uh, dabs, uh, had psychosis, jumped off the top of one of the hotels thinking he was a bird, flapped his wings and tested gravity. And unfortunately he passed away from uh, the fall. So Another thing to hit on quick is as we go through these pictures, think about how much leaf you're seeing in these. Um, the answer is not much at all. Um, when you go into these dispensaries, again, if you have a chance, I would encourage you to do it as a learning tool. Um, they are cookies, they're gummies, they're anything. Um, so just understand they're, they're actually not. You have to pretty much, a lot of them, you have to specifically ask for the leaf and they'll pull it out from behind the counter on a little tray. So again, hitting on some other kinds, you'll see these uh, black containers on the far left picture. Um, this is more wax. It's laid out on wax paper, so it doesn't stick to it. But 85% uh, uh, on the chem something or another. And then the lemon OG, 87.4%. They're both hybrids. Um, but those black containers that you can squeeze on either side and it pops a lid open, kind of looks like an old film can. People remember those. Uh, it, uh, that's what you're going to see. They'll have labels on them, especially in the state of Colorado with tracking numbers. You can actually call the marijuana enforcement division or in Colorado, they call it the med, the weed cops. Um, you can call them. They'll actually tell you what store it was sold from. If you have the tracking number still, the date it was sold from, and then they can actually help facilitate getting you video. Um, and the video in all these stores is exceptional quality. It's like watching Monday night football or any sports game. So, you know, if you have a fatal, we owe it to the victim to do everything we can to make sure it's successfully prosecuted. Well, if the person says, well, I didn't smoke marijuana, whatever, but you got a video of them buying, you know, lemon OG at 87.4% wax, it's pretty darn good evidence, in my opinion, to present to a jury of him buying the video and then looking up at the camera because usually the stores will have you, you know, they'll point up and you'll look up at the camera. So, um, like I said, uh, bubble hash, uh, you see the THC in the lower left-hand corner, that middle picture, that's the warning that it has THC in it. Uh, Colorado does that, California does that. So again, really looking at that packaging, spending that. So, um, oh, MnDOT had to also pull the 420 signs. Crazy how that works. No, no, that right picture, there's there's lotions, there's, again, you name it. Just, just understand, look at all the different products on there. Um, and if you're interested, read through the Minnesota medicinal statute um, on specifically the cameras that they have to have. Every transaction has to be on a camera. So we'll see that here, it's, it's common. The nice part of Colorado is they can literally track it from the day the plant was planted until uh, it's moved from the, dis uh, from the grow house to the dispensary to the sale. So you can track the life of the plant, I guess is the best way to put it. So here's some typical pricing if you're curious to see how much marijuana is. 28 grams of the green style would be 150. That's kind of the middle of the road. The 175 is your uh, upper middle, and then the, the top is uh, that $300 range. So, I mean, it's expensive. It's a very expensive. So people said, well, this will solve it. We'll never have, you know, street narcotic sales. Well, that's not true. Unfortunately, the, the pricing sometimes uh, pushes people out who can't afford it. Um, so smaller towns, though, robberies, stuff like that, because you're walking out with really good marijuana, and people want it, and they want to sell it. So and check out that tax rate. That's common. 19.5% on, on these products as well.
So again, more pictures uh, on the right is the transdermal patch. Um, again, transdermal means it goes on the skin into the skin. So it's something we need to be careful about people wearing patches. Um, so we have that stuff uh, to look at. And then again, more waxes, the names of them, stuff like that, just to look at. Like I said, these were all taken live in Colorado. I texted her and about 15 minutes later, she had walked into the store taking the pictures and they don't care. Like I said, it's a totally different aspect and you have to get yourself in that mindset of this isn't a bad thing. This isn't something to be ashamed of. People are extremely proud of cannabis. Um, and if you don't know the brand Cookies, uh, it's a drug brand. You should learn it. We have it up here. You know, uh, was working a concert um, and, you know, 15 people walk by with Cookies hoodies on. Well, if you don't know what they are and you're an SRO, you should learn what they are because, um, you know, not knowing, you know, kind of puts you behind the eight ball. So um, we see that stuff. So here's a couple of close-ups that she got. Um, you know, if you see the top of the, uh, there's the cherry balm with THC in it. So transdermal again through the lips, but uh, any packaging you can think of. And then what's right next to it, Narcan. So, um, you know, and then there's the other brands uh, to the right there as well. So like I said, the in, Mar in Colorado, there's that tracking division, the marijuana enforcement division. Um, it's really great. Uh, they will give you, they'll bend over backwards to help you out. You can call them. They're open. Uh, you know, Monday through Friday in Colorado, we had a way to use NCIC to send stuff off, but uh, we don't have that connection up here, unfortunately, but you can call them. They'll get you the information you need. Um, and there is that ability to, uh, to get that information back here. So, so before we take questions, uh, our contact information, again, it'll be available to you um, after we're done here. Um, I believe we're going to quick um, talk about our uh, award winners, and then we'll answer some questions. I see there's a few in the Q&A box. So we appreciate those questions. Uh, stand by and we'll get to those. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're both Tyler and I are used to taking DRE questions or whatever. If you're on the side of the road and you're looking at something and you don't understand or you need help, feel free to give my work cell a text or a call at any time. Um, it's on 24 hours a day. So if you need something, please don't hesitate to call. Uh, it is a real offer. Uh, I, you know, I'm glad to help out whenever I can. I'm going to turn it back over to moderator Tyler. We're just going to wait. There we go. All right. So before we go to Q&A, the TZD program is excited to recognize award recipient or TZD award recipient. Uh, today we are recognizing the 2021 TZD Star Media Award to Ken Thomas and Tess Taylor with 106.7. WJJY of Hubbard Radio. Ken and Tess, along with Hubbard Radio, have been great supporters of local partnerships and truly ed educating their listeners. For years, they have helped develop traffic safety PSAs. Officer Tony Rund, Rund is huge in getting the articles too. To include local leaders, athletes, and traffic safety partners. They also help recruit and record famous athletes providing great messages at no cost to TZD partners. They have done ride-alongs and have broadcasted live from a school bus explaining to listeners what they are seeing with the officers from the view of from a bus. They have scheduled a half hour every month for traffic safety to be an uninterrupted topic providing a platform to discuss the current traffic safety trends and local priorities to reach a wide community audience. They strategically seek information in every session and strive to strike a chord with the listener to change behavior. They report on local crashes and frequently advise of good driving behavior on the regular morning show. It is so frequent, it almost seems sub subtle, but the many small drops of traffic safety advice have filled Buckets of awareness for years. Simply put, for years, Ken and Tess have aired traffic safety messages and continue to do so with the same enthusiasm as when I first heard them interviewing Sergeant Kurt Mowers. No place, keep, no place keeps this message as present and fresh as WJJY's Ken and Tess. Tess and Ken, would you like to say a few words? Yes, we can do that. We are going to start our video here, I believe. Trying to. <laughs> Doesn't want to let us start the video, but that's okay. Hey, we are truly honored to receive the media award from the TZD program. And uh, 
WJJY and Hubbard Broadcasting have always focused on public service. Over the years, in fact, we've been honored with four Crystal Awards from the National Association of Broadcasters for our efforts in public service. So a number of years ago, uh, we received a call from then public information trooper Kurt Mowers with the Minnesota State Patrol. And he was wondering if we would like to talk about traffic safety on our community focus show. We do that every day at noon. And here in the Brainerd Lakes area, uh, if you've ever been here, especially uh, during the busy summer weekends, traffic can be pretty heavy on our area roads. So we said, sure, let's do it. And so uh, Kurt came on the show. Yeah, and then over the years, we talked about traffic safety related topics. Kurt brought many guests from both law enforcement and MnDOT, uh, a lot of different agencies and departments all working on traffic safety. And then we started working with an organization called the uh, Traffic Safety Coalition and had local law enforcement officers. And as you mentioned, we had some celebrities record public service announcements concerning safety on the roads and the trails and our waterways. Um, and we still run those locally produced announcements and we work with local law enforcement and TZD. And over the last two years alone, we have aired about 3,500 ads at no charge. Now we want to take this time to say thank you to some of our key partners past and present, including retired troopers Kurt Mowers and Neil Dickinson, as well as all of our local law enforcement partners. A uh, big thank you to Brian and Amber here at Hubbard Broadcasting. They did a lot of work in making sure we got those ads on the air. And a big special thank you to Tom Nixon. He is the acting regional coordinator for TZD here in the Lakes area, not only for all the times he's been on our show, but also for nominating us for this award. We are very honored and we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken and Tess. So now we'll jump over to uh, some question and answers um, that we received during the presentation. So we had a couple questions. So, um, hold on one second. I, sure. I skipped the slide, oh, sorry. Come on. Uh, while we answer questions, um, if you could, um, We'd like it if everyone could take a minute to fill out the evaluation survey. So there's a link that you can find in the chat chat box, excuse me, that was posted, and it will also be emailed to you. Um, otherwise, you can use your smartphone, hover over that QR code, and it'll pop right up on your phone. Um, the TZD leadership team does read the results from these surveys and uses this information for future events. So thank you for filling it out. So a couple of questions we received. We can go ahead with the questions now. First off, let's acknowledge moderator Tyler pulling double duty today. Everybody give him a virtual <laughs> round of applause. Thank you. This is I, hopefully next year we're all back together. I, you know, it's always a great time to see everybody at TZD, but we do have a couple of questions. So uh, Mr. Parker did talk to your question specifically about discerning between methadone sedation and uh, coincident methadone presence with other causes of distracted drowsy driving. So obviously we have a wide test, uh, the standardized field sobriety test. Um, hey, I like everybody clapping. I appreciate <laughs> that, guys. Um, we have a wide variety of tests we can do. So we're obviously looking for documented impairment. And there's a difference between drowsy and drug. And people who are trained to look for those things can see those things. There's certain signs and symptoms. And uh, I won't uh, run 165 people through all of them. But you can find them online or if you want to uh, talk with us offline, I'd be more than happy to look into those things. Um, so obviously, we're not looking to jam up a user who's using it appropriately and isn't under the influence or is kind of maintaining that baseline, but we're looking for the signs and symptoms, those clinical indicators, stuff you can't, um, that wouldn't be caused by anything else that would really help push uh, the impairment aspect versus the drowsy or, um, you know, distracted, you know, as somebody who's made a thousand traffic stops like Tyler has, we can tell when someone's texting, we can tell when they're under the influence eventually. And we can tell when they're just tired. And so there's there's ways that, you know, you go through that and that's part of the interview process. So We're also going to look into internals of the DRE. So Right. And that DRE process is that 12-step process that's really a, a good in-depth look. And just because someone undergoes a DRE eval doesn't mean they're going to stay under arrest. They can be ruled out for medical reasons, et cetera, and stuff like that. So, so the Delta-8 platform, you want to cover that one? Yeah, so Delta-8... Um, is not a plant form, it's synthesized from THC. Um, so it's going to look, a lot of times it'll be a clear, uh, maybe cloudy look to it, um, but it's almost like a, a wax feeling to it as well. So just understand it's synthesized, it's broken down from THC. Refined from would be refined, another way to think yes. about it. So um, hopefully Mr. Grams, that answers your question, no relation. 
Ms. Grams, I'm sorry. I apologize. Like I said, I was up all night. I got home at 7 a.m. and then I rolled over here. So I do apologize. Um, oh, uh, normal folks driving impaired for stressed out mom, the busy business exec. The busy business exec. There's one from the uh, NHTSA. NHTSA, yes. Yeah. Um, prescription drugs. Yeah. So it isn't your stereotype stoners. That's correct. I mean, there are executives from companies. If you look in the news, um, Joe Rogan, you know, a huge proponent of marijuana use, right? He is not your stereotypical stoner walking around, um, you know, being catatonic. You'll see videos of him working out, um, being on stage, but he'll talk about how he just went back and smoked a blunt. So, um, you know, like I said, there's that, uh, uh, you know, aspect, the culture has changed. Um, you know, in the nine, late nineties, they talked about the Oxycontin soccer moms that were getting hooked on these pills. So, uh, unfortunately a tragic part of this has been, um, people getting, uh, hooked on, uh, you know, the drugs that have a, you know, blown ACL. So they go, uh, start that route and they go on, on to, um, different addictions. So that the culture is changing. Um, you know, and like I said, you have to look at every traffic stop, and that first initial contact, that's your view into that person's world. If you don't know them, especially working in a big city, most of the people I stop, I don't know. Um, and then start working from there. So there's no uh, textbook stoner anymore. There's no textbook opiate user. There are very successful people, unfortunately, um, who fall the adults of addiction or abuse and, uh, you know, have to go through that process. Yeah. Um, another question that came in, do you think... Um, did that one. Do you think or do you believe there is any connection between popularity of marijuana use and the shortage of commercial drivers? That's a great question, and I've never thought about that. You know, um, I have no idea. I've I've seen I've seen commercial drivers use marijuana, um, but I mean I, I don't know if that's a direct relation. Um, sub side note: uh, if you do have a habitual marijuana user and they have a permit to carry card, um, you can uh, send that permit to carry card back to the sheriff's office. One of the big things that we were seeing in the city is a lot of people will. Uh, get their uh, permits carry card, but uh, you do a marijuana DUI on them. I'll talk to them during the, before I make the arrest. How often do you use it? Um, you know, the frequency of use, do you carry your gun when you use it? Stuff like that. Well, if you're a habitual user of a schedule one controlled substance, you cannot have a permit to carry. And for no argument's sake, just the fact is, is marijuana is still a schedule one controlled substance. So if you're a habitual user, we can uh, draw that connection as well. So kind of in the same vein, but uh, Keep that in mind as well and make sure we're seizing those permits to carry cards, especially if people are under the influence. And not, not to dodge your question, uh, Marley. I dodged um, it. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. That'd be a great question for um, some of our CBIs maybe would know. I, I would like to think no, um, not to the extent we're seeing right now, um, but certainly I would assume a, a few. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I don't think it's our main issue and cause of it right now. Yeah, I think it's much more comfortable to sit on your couch at some point too. So, um, Bruce put something in the chat that much of British Empire has shortage of CDL drivers with drug use, including THC, um, prohibiting licensure. So yeah, I mean, to that extent, I I guess I was uh, assuming Marley, you were you were talking about um, just kind of them quitting their job so they could use rather than getting. Uh, prohibited from using for a violation. Um, so yeah, certainly, I guess if you look at it as them losing their license from it, I would assume that would cause some some flux in, in those uh, drivers being available as well. So, yeah. That's um, a great question. No, that was a good one. I haven't had that one before. I appreciate that. So um, like I said, guys, the reason why we really hit on the marijuana section, opiates are obviously something important to know. We're seeing a lot more of them, but just because you have marijuana on board, um, you know, it doesn't exclude having uh, fentanyl. Um, PCP has made a comeback. Uh, you know, I had an incident in July of last year with a guy on PCP um, and, you know, was not a fun experience. So just keep that stuff in mind, be safe. Uh, are people typically mixing alcohol use along with drug use? If so, how is it affecting impairment? Yeah, um, absolutely. It can be uh, mixed together. Um, you know, people drink, they smoke weed uh, or whatever the case may be, drink, use cocaine. Um, so it depends on the drug category, obviously, right? So we're talking about those uh, alcohol falls into the depressant category, um, and it depends on what other category you're adding. Are they using alcohol and Valium, which would be another depressant, you kind of get that larger scale uh, reaction. So uh, otherwise, um, yeah, uh, it just depends. Um, it depends on the person. It depends on uh, what they're doing that night. 
Friday night coming out of the bars. It wouldn't be unprecedented to see a lot of people under a mix. Yeah. All right, we are running out of time here. So if you have any questions, like I said, our contact information will be available uh, to you. Feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. Thank you to our uh, speaker and our speakers, both of us. Thank you for yeah, coming. Thank Alex. you, Tyler. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and our hard work. And our viewers. Moderator. We had a lot of viewers. We really appreciate you guys listening today. Um, we hope you learned something new and will share your knowledge with your colleagues as well. Uh, we encourage you to follow the Minnesota TZD program on its social media. Thank you. Also follow Tyler. He needs the help. And the, and the Kush. And the Kush. And the Kush. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you next year.